If you've all seen the book and the website, you would have seen this work. I'll just say about this that it, it's obviously inspired by Manet, uh, Déjeuner sur l'herbe. And I painted this, I, I, when I finished art school, I went to London and spent a year in London. And I just looked at lots of things. I actually didn't do any painting. I lived in squats. I looked at art. I had a great time, really. And then I came back and um, went into my first collective studio. And this is the very first painting that I painted when I came back from London. And uh, it's amazing what just that year of looking meant to the work, the way that it had developed. And it, this was painted, just a little bit about the technical thing. It, it, that was a friend of mine at the time. And I did a set up so that I set that picnic up. And I went to apple orchards and photographed an apple orchard and a Stricklandy tree and, you know, all of that. And then I montaged it, which is how I worked at the time. So I put the photographs together so that I actually knew what the painting was going to look like in my head before I painted it, which is not the way that I worked a bit later on in my career, but that was how I started. That's called The Snake is Dead. It also looks like it's painted quite photorealistically, but in actual fact, when you see it, it's much more impressionistic than what I'm doing right now. Oh yeah, this is a student work, I must have. This is the last work that I did when I was at art school in fourth year. You can see, I mean, I, I was already starting to work with uh, images of women, uh, but technically it was quite gauche by you know, like a year later and I came back and painted the other one. But it was fantastic because I, you know, I, this is the first time I ever won a prize was in my final year at art school. And I, like, I can play it down a bit by saying, when I went through art school it was very much about um, abstraction painting was very in, so they didn't actually teach a lot of figurative painting and I was very unusual in that I wanted to paint figuratively and so I just did. And at the end of fourth year they gave a prize for um, you know, life drawing and painting, but of course they hadn't given one for four years because nobody was doing it, so it was kind of <laughs> prized by default. <laughs> this is around the same period, I mean I was spending probably at least seven months on a work at that point. This is called High and Dry, and I actually did, that's me, although I think I've been extremely unflattering to myself in retrospect. Um, we actually did go, uh, myself and a friend went to the Northern Territory and went to the places and photographed all of these images and again I montaged them and put them together. I can't actually say what it's inspired by though. I don't think there's any other particular painting that comes to mind with this. I think this one was, you know, out of my little dream world or something. Four paintings called Heads Above Water, which I think it's, there were two things happening at this point. I had seen all of Monet's work, so I was very interested in water. Uh, I wanted to stop painting quite so uh, photo, no, it was not photorealistically, but so tightly. Mm -hmm. So I wanted a chance to splash around some paint and everything, so I got sort of five half naked. How many are there? One, two, three, four. Anyway, we're all half naked mm -hmm. in a friend's swimming pool and, and uh, took photos and, and these are what came out of it. This was one of the first paintings that, um, again, I was really trying to break through styles. I, I, I get bored, you know, and it's like I've been painting those rather large heads now f since 1999, along with other things in between, like the big nude and flogging the rocking horse, which some of you have seen, and uh, so I do different things. But I get bored, you know, and then there'll be this quite dramatic change. Um, the background, which you can see, is crumpled up. That, I saw a painter called Julian Schnabel, who's based in New York. Um, I, when I, I had the, um, a studio in Paris for 12 months in 1987, and it was during this time I saw a retrospective of Julian Schnabel at the Pompidou, and the way that he worked, it just was you know, mind-boggling to me. And so it wasn't like copying, but I just thought he was so brave. And so I just went back and started doing weird and wonderful things with canvases before I painted on them. Do you um, want to say? How did you put this one together? Like what medium? Uh, it, that one would have, it, if, if I'm going to crumple up the canvas like that, it's usually acrylic in the background. So it's a gesso base. And then uh, I crumple it up and then different colours of acrylic. And then I open it up and iron it then it's painted on the top with oils because you can't go the other way around so um, I have done that technique with oils but it's really messy and 
you know, it's not environmentally sound really <laughs> either. Um, so that would have been one of the first times that I, I did that technique and then uh, I, after a while I, uh, I was going through a stencil phase so I actually put a stencil over the top of it and you do that by masking bits and pieces and laying down a stencil and spraying with acrylic spray. These are a little bit out of sync in um, chronologically. That's a self-portrait, uh, me and the Olgas. It's called uh, Wrestling with the Cherubin. Not particularly inspired by any one painting. I have actually painted a lot of paintings that deal with romance and the pitfalls and entanglements of romance, or romantic love, shall we say. This is another one. This I painted this in Paris in 1987. It was probably the first painting that I painted in the studio that, that I had there because I could actually see these amazing trees. I arrived in, um, on November the 26th and had this, had this amazing view over the river and you know just out of the windows you could actually see these plane trees, really old ones and of course it was autumn and they were that colour and uh, of course Paris is the place of romance. I mean it, just, it was amazing. So this, this is called Oboa. And I'm actually wrapped in a snake. Now you read into it what you like, but you know, it's, <laughs> it was an amazing adventure. You would have seen this in the book, I guess it's called Romances in the Air, another Paris painting. And this was the very first painting where I crumpled up the canvas. And I did, I did the background to this one in Paris and um, um, finished it back in Australia. It was also when I first started working at, at Very Large. And they, the gargoyles actually are from Notre Dame because you, you can actually go up the stairs and you can actually get quite close to the gargoyles and take photos. And, um, it's called uh, Gabriella. That's a, a friend of mine. She, actually, the person who owns this rang the other day and said, people keep asking me you know, what the babies are. And you know, she said, people keep saying it's really bloody and you know, is it an abortion or whatever. Actually, it's not. They're just, they're, they're actually, they're drowning, you know, but it's not, they're drowning in kind of red, the colour of romance again. It's, it's not particularly murderous, shall I say. But the thing is, it'll be very interesting because I, I, I can draw anything, but I can't draw well, if you know what I mean. Like I could draw a table, a chair, a person, a face but I can't make a really fabulous drawing of it. It'll just look like a representation. So my workbooks are mostly about, um, I write. Uh, so, but I've actually, since I've been working on the computer with my work, um, I don't use these books. And I was looking at this one just a minute ago going, oh, it's got some room left in it. I might go back and you know, put some more stuff in it. But, but the point is that in one of these, it was one of my Paris workbooks, and it's actually got some photos and things from the photo session. Old Olympia, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> and of course, the Old Olympia comes, it's like Ode to Olympia, Odd Olympia, because it's Manet's work in the background, down the bottom of uh, seven of my friends. And I actually did quite a good copy of the Manet painting. And uh, it, it, I, it was quite brave to just then, I, then I crumpled it up. I actually, you know, just scrunched it all up. And because it was painted in oils, I then had to pour oil over it. So it's got burnt umber oil over it. I knew I was really brave at that point. You know, you put in the bath and you've just spent two months painting this thing, which I could quite happily have on my bedroom wall, thanks. And just kind of, you know, and then you know, like this undoing it, you know. And of course you, you undo it and parts of it are wet. So you've got a little bit of time to mop some things up that, you know, perhaps there's too much or whatever. And then I uh, turned it upside down and painted the curtains and the fish and the other figures. So is that what those little flecks and patches are? They're, they're not actually like flowers or anything, it's the crumpling yeah. and the burnt umber sort yeah. of staining. Yeah. And so in, uh, in some other paintings that I'll show you, I use that crumpling to suggest things. So then I've gone on to paint flowers or bugs or but it starts off like that and then, you know, if you, we all can sort of hallucinate a bit if you turn the lights down low enough, you put on a candle and you'll see things, you know, it's like seeing things in the clouds or... A question of unity. This has uh, Marilyn Munro, of course, inspired by Marilyn Munro. The three faces are three friends of mine. 
this brought into another technique. I don't think it was the first time I used it, but I painted a night, uh, you know, like a sunset and a, uh, just a skyscape during the day on either side. And then I actually sanded it off with an orbital sander. So it was painted with oil paint and you let it dry and then you just get an orbital sander out and, you know, go over the top of it and it'll give you that kind of texture because it'll take on the texture of the wall behind the canvas. So if you want it smooth, you've got to do it on a smooth surface. If you want it textured, you do it on a textured. And so that gave me the background and then I would have worked on the faces behind the Marilyn, maybe sanded them back a bit, worked on them, sanded them back a bit, and then put the um, image over the top. I had to work on Marilyn's face on a ladder. It was, when, because that's over three metres tall. Uh, it's a very arduous thing to do. I think now I'm sensible enough and I've got enough money that if I do things like that, I'm going to go and hire a mini scaff, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it, it's a lot safer and a lot less arduous. So this is um, Entanglement Landscape Libido. The pink canvas on the left started out being scrunched up and it, so it's got a pink acrylic background and then it had burnt umber and maybe pink red, I don't know, um, poured onto it. And depending upon how wet the paint is or, you know, there's a lot of different ways of manipulating it while it's on the canvas, but you come up with all these little things and it suggested all of this to me. At this point, with these paintings, I wasn't trying to impose on the canvas what I was going to paint. Uh, I'd just make this thing and uh, pull it apart and see, see what it was. And that the entanglement landscapes, I'm about to start another one, they're very attractive to me for that reason that I can't really control them that you know, they're going to suggest something to me. So it's, it's actually a much more creative way of working than, um, than knowing what I'm going to paint, you know, when I do the montages. and Because I mix things up, you know, sometimes I, I, I'll do a painting like the entanglement libido and then this idea will come to me, this caused something fishy going on. Mm -hmm. And that's me and that's meant to be my brain. So I'm actually, and the birth canal. So I'm actually being born into my own brain. That's about as literal as translation as I'm ever going to give of a painting. But that's because I actually know what that one's about very succinctly. So, you know, I, I, and I, I've always painted fish. I love painting fish. So every now and then, I, I mean, I just go from one thing to the other. And that's the amazing thing about having a lot of different skills that, you know, I'm not particularly stymied by not being able to do certain things. This is another entanglement landscape um, inversion. Of course, it, inversion is about becoming, you know, something else. And it started off just like the others. I crumpled it, I poured paint, I pulled it apart, and the first thing I painted was the figure in the, the centre, and everything else just kind of flowed out of that. And it's an incredibly simple painting, but when it's a, and it's a big painting. It's about two, 250, 260 long. Sometimes you don't need to put more into a painting. Wish you were here, having a wonderful time. I must have been going through something. <laughs> um, that was a, a painting that somebody had left in the studio. It was an abstract painting and it was getting damaged and I tried to find this person and I thought, oh, well, they obviously don't want it. So I um, took the old orbital sander to it and <laughs> used it as a background for my painting. I make small forays every now and then into three-dimensional work and there's very little of it showing here but uh, this is actually a painting done onto galvanised iron letters. They're about uh, 100 mil, 10 centimetres you know, thick and metre each way that I found in a um, salvage yard. And so that's primed with gesso, you, you know, you, you clean it and prime it with gesso and then you can actually just paint on it with oil paint. From this, um, I made, had letters made with a wooden backing and a mirror on the front and showed them so there was God, cat, echo, things like that and had a show of three-dimensional works. This was the first time I used a laser scan. The, the scan on the bottom is from Masaccio, which is a fresco in I don't know where anymore. Anybody know where that is? Florence maybe? Well, I've got a feeling it's somewhere quite a bit more obscure than that. So I had a laser, laser scans were very new at that point. I, didn't, I, I did it, I think, out of curiosity as to what a laser scan can do. But I didn't particularly like it as a finished thing. You go, what do you do with this now? So what do you do with it? You cut it up 
and I sewed edges onto it so that I could stretch it. So I've got a great machine that'll do very heavy duty work. And then the paintings at the top are, are actual paintings done onto bits of canvas that are again sewn onto the um, laser scan. And it becomes an interesting thing. You just have to constantly think sideways about how you're going to make a, a painting. Growing older is a once in a lifetime experience. This is two paintings. The painting underneath, which you can see, I don't know if you can make it out. It, when you actually see the thing in the flesh, you can. There's a graveyard scene under here. That's uh, one of the, like a statue. It's actually got Bridget Bardo's face, which you can't see here. So that was a complete painting. There's crows and tombstones and, you know, metal sort of surrounds of graves and old plastic flowers and things. And that was actually shown in the 1984 Biennale, um, Sydney Biennale, uh, along with three other paintings. And, but when it came back, I didn't like it very much. I, I kind of found it really stodgy. Um, I didn't want to paint like that anymore. So again, I took the sander to it. <laughs> and in fact, one of my friends who's a cartoonist slipped in a little cartoon under my door of my studio and it had this little image of me with my orbital sander and it said, if in doubt, sand the shit out of it. <laughs> Pretty funny. Anyway, so I sanded it and then uh, painted the image over the top with a lot of glazes and this, uh, I can't tell you what this is inspired by, but you've got in the background, you've got four Marys. You've got Marilyn Munro, Marilyn being a, a, a derivative of Mary, Maria Callas, Marie Antoinette and Mary, mother of Jesus. Uh, you've got a fish again and that's the same technique. It's a crumple technique, but in between the crumples and some of those, I've actually put gold leaf. So it's you know, a very laborious process of painting in between you know, on the little white patches. Camellia complex, okay. Uh, this is obviously inspired by um, Ongra, yeah? Uh, the bathhouse thing, you know, with, yes. Again, it's that crumple kind of technique and what I do is paint on top of it with oil paint and when I want it to look transparent like that, I spray it with turps and lay a piece of cloth down and rip it off. And it'll take, you know, a certain amount of the paint off and let you see through to the background. It's much easier than trying to paint so delicately that you can actually see through to the background. It's better to paint just as you paint and then, you know, rip some off. And then I sewed some raw linen around the edge uh, and the, the raw linen is what's the base for the camellias. And because I wanted the raw linen to be there, where the camellias are, I only gessoed where the camellias are. So again, an extremely laborious process, like you draw it out and that would be done with an overhead projector or something because it needs to be very precise. And then I paint it white in between the lines, you know, to leave the raw canvas on the outside. And you can just see the stitching marks here where I stitched it on. This was a, another laser scan. Uh, when I've spent a lot of time in Paris, apart from that first 12 months, I actually have spent seven years on and off living in Paris. And everyone goes, oh, <laughs> it was just that good. Um, but while I'm there, I often lived in small apartments because it was only for 12 months that I really had a studio. And I kept working. So this is from, uh, a I made lots of collages. In fact, that's something I forgot. To, I was going to bring some to show you. You know, you just utilise whatever space you've got. I'd go to the markets and buy lots of books of um, out of copyright little prints and things and just make collage after collage. And so this was a collage that I made and I purposely made it look old. You put glue on it, you know, you put coffee on it, you know, all this. And it'll show when, and this is a laser scan, it's two metres by two metres. And I actually made it with the idea of painting over the top of it but I loved it so much that I couldn't paint over the top of it. So it's just a laser scan from a collage that I've done. The most interesting, th that, that's me on the top left and uh, there's the one model down the bottom, two faces, another friend up there. I've used, this, used stencils quite a lot and there'll be a couple more examples of that. So that's the most interesting thing, but those faces, the way that I got them to be so pale was that I used that canvas as the positive to do monographs, which I'll show you in a minute, the monographs from the positives. So in actual fact, these are pale because I'd done a print from them. And then when I'd done four prints, I just left that and, and made that into a painting as well. So they're the faces on, um, that I did the monographs. So if we go back, 
if you have a look at this face here, particularly these two, So there's um, that face and that face. And they're actually done onto just fabric that uh, I'd go and choose a fabric from a discount shop that has a little bit of nap on it, you know, so that it'll grab paint. And I um, gessoed the back so that a bit of the gesso came through, but it didn't get rid of the nap altogether. So you've still got a surface to work on. And that was done to make the print. So I'd lay that down on the face. I know a person who's, um, who bought not one of these, but a painting that had ink on it. And I just, I was at his house and it's starting to fade, so you've got to be careful. I've got to go to his house and redraw some of that. Is it like ink on the silk or? Uh, the or There's two things happening here. This is just drawn onto normal fabric. And they're actually, uh, you know those refillable Pantone pens that you can buy? It's, that's what I used. But now I think I'd have to use more permanent markers because they are fading. This is actually three-dimensional. What you've got happening here is that there's two surfaces. Behind here is a yellow fabric with a face painted onto it. And this one is a monoprint on a scrim, like a really fine cotton that actually sits, you know, that far away. Because I had my, I've got a dad who's a builder so he can make frames for me and stuff. So it actually sits that far. So you've actually got two images. This one is, so it's like looking through something. It's called Room. It's got a knitted frame around it. That's probably the most interesting thing about that. Ah, the, the only other interesting thing is this is, I've just got a computer. <laughs> and that, see that blurry face, that's actually painted. But it's from a hard copy from the computer, so it's you know it's like me playing with filters, you know, <laughs> and um, learning Photoshop. So, is that really hard to paint? Like really disconcerting to paint? I, well, the thing is, I was nuts enough to try it, and I, I didn't find it at the time. But you know, I'd probably think twice about it. <laughs> It actually, it's one of those paintings that works much better in the flesh. You know, some paintings reproduce better and, and some look better in the flesh. There's another example of um, the uh, stencil. I painted the background image of the woman and uh, the ropes. And then I actually masked the ropes with um, tape and laid the stencil down and then repainted bits and pieces. I've used that particular, especially with the little boy and the girl on the lace, I've used that in a lot of paintings. Because I was using acrylic spray, I could actually wash it out and reuse the fabric. I think sometimes you can put too, too much significant onto, significance onto things like that. Sometimes I just go on a roll and go, oh, next. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's just something you've got to do and you, know, you, you can't question it too much. It's a three metre nude called um, Framed. Again, what I was doing was taking the female out of the frame and she was holding up the frame. And she's gargantuan, she's huge. Yeah, I was wondering if that was a bit of a reference to Atlas, or like she's holding them and waiting expectation or something. Well, I actually painted a male nude that might have been more a reference. He had a boulder, you know, a huge rock. Because I actually think that both men and women carry the weight of expectation. It's not just, you know, and uh, that women carry these things, men do as well. And so I actually did paint a man. I don't know if I've got it here, hang on. Um, what happened to him though, was that when, it's now called cut and it actually looks like that, was that once I'd painted the male, I, mean, I think that, you know, I, I can paint a man. Because people say, well, you know, why don't you paint men? Well, I can paint men. But when I'd finished it, it, it the way that society reads women and men in paintings is very, very different. And, you know, I had a problem painting the male penis, which is a three metre nude, again, so it's quite, it was very confronting, because you, you kind of go, is this too much for you guys? No. And, and you're going, well, shall it be erect or flaccid? You know, because it's going to be read so differently. And there's so much that's hidden about a female that you're almost allowed to look at her body, you know, whereas, and it was just, I finished it and you know, I'd started painting the boulder and I was, uh, I was so confronted by it myself and in retrospect I should not have cut it up. It, do you know what I mean? I should have stepped back and got, rolled it up 
put it away for two years and had another look at it. But because it's very unusual for me to be so confronted, you know, because I do some pretty out there kind of things. So I cut it up. And then, like the next day, I went, oh my God, you know. So I went rummaging. <laughs> And this bit was left. I mean, it wasn't cut nice and neat like that. I mean, it was, you know. And I thought, well, that's pretty amazing. You know, that, um, that I could salvage that from that. And uh, it's painted on the decorative background the same as, that's actually um, curtain fabric that I've just, uh, what I do is cover it with clear gesso and, you know, throwing some paint around on it and everything. And then where the body is, it's that question of, you know, outlining the body and putting white gesso where the body is going to be because otherwise you'll never get the luminosity of skin. Uh, that's a laser scan from a collage, again the same period as the other collage. Where all the images are painted on top, you can see that um, this is not collage, nor that, nor any of the flowers or these faces or the, that or that. Um, so it's the same process again that on top of the laser scan where I want to paint, I have to paint it white underneath. So what I did with this was um, the collage didn't look like this. I put it into the computer and reversed certain things and changed colours. Don't have much to say about that except I'd stuck a bit. That little bit that's stuck on there is t-shirt fabric which is makes, you can do great monographs on t-shirt fabric. So I painted this little face and then I actually just stuck it onto the painting. But sometimes you do things like that just because it's, it makes the composition better. You know, there's no real smart rationale for it or anything. This was, must have been, this is the second, the first large head I did. And the really interesting thing about this is that I was very tired of things taking so long to paint. And I was very interested in Tretchikov. And so I, I just wanted to reuse some of that imagery and I wanted to do some fast paintings. So I was doing, this took four days, which for me is, you know, uh, amazing. I'd do the first layer of everything in two days, the second layer in two days, whammo. And it was really exhilarating. So that's how the big heads, I just wanted to cut through everything again, you know, and just do something else. So probably the, the, the first ten paintings took only four days each. And now that I've really tightened up again and... Uh, most of you would know by now that I've got a show in New York in January and most of the stuff for that is again really tight. When I come back I want to do something again to stop that. That's just a reversal. You've got uh, the positive painting on the left and then I do a monoprint so it's reversed and then I go back and repaint the positive and then there's a bit of ink drawing on it. They're little boy dolls from 1900. Again, a laser scan, that's about five metres long. That's a combination of three small collages that I had blown up and put together uh, with quite a lot of painting on it. That was the second big head that I did. Of course, I'd played with them in the computer a bit because if you actually put uh, your paint daubs filter over the top, then, you know, it'll give you an indication of how it's going to look if you do it quick. And then I got really interested in duplicating things like I've done, you know, I'd go, w wonder what it would look like if I did three of these and tried to make them look the same, you know. And of course you can't make them look the same, so the really interesting thing is going from one to the other because no matter how much you try and make them look the same, I mean it's a silly thing to be fascinated by, but I still am fascinated by it. So I've got a few paintings, uh, two paintings going to New York that are like this, that want, you know, they look the same and not the same. Oh, I got really carried away. Mm. These weren't taking four days at this point. I think things like this, you know, um, to me are much more about they've become so abstract that the concept is, plays very much a second fiddle to the painting. In some other paintings, the concept's are really, really important. In these, it's the painting. I get tired of doing the one thing. Yeah. I've had, you know, I've been painting for 20 years and I can paint in lots of different styles and I can't bear to paint this, keep painting the same thing. And so I, at the moment, I've got some very complicated paintings going on. I'm about to start another entanglement landscape and I'll keep doing the big heads. 
so that the mixture is enough to keep me interested. You know, that's basically what it is. I mean, some people are really happy to find a style and just go with it. You know, that's, I think it's really boring for me. Some of you um, would have seen this. Did Paul Greenaway know? I know. Last, last year. year. Sometimes I rework things. I'm, I, I get to a point, I said this is a bit of a reworking of um, Growing Older is a Once in a Lifetime Experience where she's floating over the graveyard. Um, because, you know, when, before I used to think, well, you, you know, one concept, one idea, and now I think I could probably spend a lifetime working with one concept. You know, there's so many different paintings to be done out of the one concept. Ah, there's a portrait of me done by Rosemary Valadon. She, she did this series of portrait of women as goddesses and for some reason saw me as Aphrodite. But it was very interesting to model because I, you know, other people don't paint me very often. So we went to the market and bought this wedding dress and, and I modelled. I, th I think it's really interesting. I know what people, how confronted they are by looking at themselves when you paint them because I think I look like I've done 10 rounds with, you know, somebody. And that's my self-portrait. Um, I've done two versions of this, and the, the um, turban comes from a painting by uh, Tamara de Limpica called Wisdom. And the idea of me putting that same turban on my own head is like, you know, maybe if I put this turban on, you know, I'll be wise. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work like that, but, you know. The painting that I'm working on in the middle there, I did show when it was finished like that, but I've reworked that painting now for New York. So now it has a completely new layer over the top of it. It's a ref I, the rocking horse, like the, the whole idea of flogging the rocking horse going nowhere. You can ride a rocking horse as long as you like and you ain't going to get anywhere, except you're going to to and fro a bit. A woman wearing a dildo, there's no man in that picture. That, but, but it's really interesting that one, you, you strap this on and it's almost, it almost, it's almost like you could get pleasure from it. But, but I'm not talking about pleasuring someone else with it. She actually is trying to pleasure herself. But it's just that thing of futile pleasure, futility. It's a painting of futility. You know, that's, that's what that painting's all about. Um, I think it's the painting, um, Urban Cabins, I'm not sure, is it the three women? Um, is that a comment on integration? Is the order significant? Um, no, the order is not significant. The fact that they're exotic is significant. And the only, um, the background is full of turmoil. If you, it's smoke that goes behind them. Um, I'm interested in placing exotica into a suburban situation. So a lot of my work gets bought by wealthy, middle, upper class people and placed into, you know, wealthy, wonderful homes. And I find it qu a little bit subversive that a lot of my images are um, very exotic. They're, often, they're sometimes of people that wouldn't normally be in a situation like that. Some of my work's commenting, the urban turbans is really, it's just to do with exotica, but you know, there's a danger in the background. They're very passive. I don't understand, it's a very new painting for me, like it hasn't been finished that long and so sometimes I'll understand something I do a little bit further down the track because more work supports it and so it becomes clearer what I'm talking about. Um, in your um, painting mirror face, was there a significance with the, um, the types of flowers that you used in the background? Honestly that was a, a design thing. I'd been looking through a book on Chinese gardens and if I'm not exactly stuck for ideas, but you know, you're searching, you know, kind of, and um, I'll just go into bookshops and leaf through things, and these images were amazing. And first of all, I saw the image of the flowers, and it was the way that they were uh, presented in a flower show. So those little blue tags are actually have the names of the flowers on them. But I know they were in the painting originally, uh, but my calligraphy wasn't good enough. That it looked really scrappy. So I took them out and it worked better anyway. But so originally I was attracted to the flowers. And then I put in my computer and started, you know, zipping things around because I can do layers now. <laughs> and, <laughs> and went, wow, that looks amazing. And so it, I, I don't think it meant anything more than that. And the mirror face, you know what a mirror face is? A mirror face really is the face that you pull in the mirror and that you think you would like the world to see. So we kind of go, 
you know, we suck our, <laughs> suck our cheeks in and look at ourselves sideways, you know. And of course, that's not how we appear at all. But um, so uh, there was a painting in a show that was just of the hibiscus, and I called it my mirror face because, you know, it, it, that, the hibiscus is so beautiful, you know, that that's how I would like to be seen. And so there's a whole lot of stuff mixed up in there and, you know, I can't get too literal about that painting, but sometimes when something, the concept has to be slightly less than the painting. You can't have a concept that's going to override the painting. The, to make a good painting is, is more important for me. I was going to say, with the My Mirror Face and Mirror Face, you know how they're the same hibiscus and the same context, would you put them together or keep them separate? Like, the artworks, would you want people to draw connections with them? Or, like, set them together? And oh, I like having them in the same show because um, I think it's easier to get... You'd be surprised how many people don't know what a mirror face is. Mirror face think just something that is mirrored, but it's actually quite a bit larger than that. And so if they get my mirror face at all, then maybe it helps read other things. When I saw both, I understood it more after seeing my mirror face. Mm. Yeah, I mm. But of course, that's not going to ha be how they'll be shown most of the time. They'll get split up, so. I'm sorry. Um, is the idea with the turbans, you were saying, um, trying to be beautiful on the turban for the wisdom, is that idea followed through all the women who have turbans? In uh, what has happened since um, I had turbans of my own made after that. So I, I've now got three turbans. They're not complete, they're bases so that, you know, I can have a model and um, uh, put the base for the turban on. I've got a red, a green one and a yellow one. And then I, I use other fabric to personalise the turban. And so I've just done photos of a model that two of the paintings will be going to New York with my turban on them. So it's kind of gone a different way. She's a coloured girl. She's part Rwandan, part English. So she's sort of not particularly dark. So I'm starting to use contemporary women rather than most of the images of the, the big heads and things have been borrowed from Tretchikov, Tamara de Lampica, Angra, Da Vinci, you know. So I'm starting to use my own turbans and uh, my own models. Isn't the picture, I'm not quite sure which one, one of the pictures you um, mixing different uh, parts of different cultures, like the, the Asian, Sort of eyes and the turban. That is there any particular reason for that? Is that to give it like you know her identity, or to include all? I think it's to include everything. I mean, most of those faces. There's a uh, in the um, urban turbans. The face on the left is kind of based on a painting by Tamara de Lempica. The middle one is based on a painting by Tretchikov, and the face on the right is a complete hybrid. It, I've made it up. So um, it, it's to include everything because, I mean, that's basically what is happening, is that cultures are being mixed. It's like the girl that modelled for me. She's a, she's a Tootsie princess who's, who was born in London. Do you get, like, a lot of criticism for some of the provocativeness of your work? Um, the people who, who uh, criticise it, I actually, I don't get criticised. I get criticised for things, but not very rarely for that because I think there's a lot of people out there who like to see an artist making statements about things because a lot of art is just so damn safe. You want to... Really, I mean, most people are making just purely decorative work and there's so much of it around. You know, so I get criticised for the way that I use women, uh, sometimes the fact that I'm too decorative, I can get criticised for my colour, for my scale, for, you know, for lots of things, but not many people, because I kind of think that if people find my work too provocative, they won't go and see it. Somebody would have already told them there's a painting with purple dildos, you know, and um, so, but I'm sure there are people who do criticise it, but they wouldn't go and see it. Uh, is there any reason why you use, like, famous people like before you used to use a lot of your friends, do you use them more now at all? I use whatever comes to mind. You know, it, 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 I think things just have a natural progression and at whatever I was thinking at that time and, and appropriation meant something different too, that it was, you know, postmodernism, appropriation, they go together and everybody was appropriating so it was okay to do it. I tried to do it in a, in a fairly individualistic kind of way but um, 
and it's not so okay to appropriate now. So you just kind of move along with what's happening with the times and anything else. But you know, truly, if it came into my mind to use Madonna in a painting, I would. You know, I actually think, and it's really important to not censor yourself too much. There's so much art going on that if you stop to think every time you try to do something creative, you will block yourself because you'll go, oh, that's not a good idea. Oh, that's been done before. And you know, if you think about it, everything's been done before. So, you know, just try and do it in your way, you know. And so I just kind of think you just do it and do it quick. Judge it later. Do you find then that you ever get stuck for ideas? Are you ever sort of sitting in your studio going, next? Actually, let's just go, and I do touch wood, is that in 20 years, no. I can honestly say never. You know, that, that one thing just... And the thing is that because I can paint, if I I'm, if I'm, haven't got a really good idea, I'll just paint. I mean, I can paint flowers, I can paint faces, you know, then I'll just paint something and it'll, it'll lead on to something. But, but I, I don't think you should stop working. Um, is there any reason why you chose to paint Marilyn Monroe? Oh, she's, you know, she's a tragedy queen, you know, and, and it's just so attractive. And I've done more images than what you've seen of Marilyn Monroe. Um, I still, f I'm like every, I'm so attracted to the, that combination of, of, you know, what she is and you, yet we never know the reality. Nobody even knows how she died. Mm -hmm. You know, so she's endlessly fascinating. And, um, and I wanted to do a, an amazing image of her. She's been painted so badly, mm -hmm. you know, in lots of ways and I wanted to do something that I thought was... Um, what was behind Fishing in Paris? Why did you say to Fishing in Paris? Well... It's really easy. I'm about to go fishing in New York. I mean, you know, really, fishing in Paris is just a comment on the fact that people go to these big cities going, I'm going to be famous. <laughs> Do you know, like, like some, yeah, I'm going to be discovered, you know. And so you go and you kind of poke your nose into places and, you know, see how they feel about your work and stuff like that. It's just, you're fishing. And so I was fishing in Paris because I painted them in Paris. Um, in a small apartment again and you know, eventually the lounge room looked like an aquarium. I mean there are these fish because I stick them up with blue tack because I painted a hundred and there's, mu there's only 49 in that piece they've got in the um, art gallery but I painted 149 or something like that so. What did you do with the rest of them? Um, gave them away mostly as presents. Do you have any spare? Have any spare? I've only got one fish and it's mine. <laughs> and I don't think I'm going to paint any more. I think I'm fished out. So that's not a primary way in the way that you work then? No, I work directly onto the canvas mostly. And now in the computer. But you know, I'm not very good at the computer. You know, well I just, I can do what I need to do. Sometimes. <laughs> Do you have to completely like stuff up and have to throw the painting away or do you just keep working on it until it starts to work? Uh, good question. Uh, no, I just cut up two paintings last week and put them in the bin. <laughs> but what I tend to do now, because I made the mistake with cutting up the, the male nude, um, I, I hang on to them for a while um, before I cull them. But once I've decided, like, you know, 12 months later or something, I will look at them and see if I want to paint over them. And some of them can be saved like that. I'll sand them and do something else. But I look, if I look at them and they freak me out too much because they're so bad, um, I don't want, even want that as an underpainting. So then I cut them up so they can't be saved and put them in the bin. I've just got one question about when you make your selections for the exhibition, is that you do that all alone? Is it always your equipment or does about what you should include in the next edition? Um, some dealers will. Uh, I mean, like, the dealer in New York has a very specific uh, way that she wants her gallery to look. And so she likes it to be underhung rather than overhung, so she'd prefer less works than more works. And, and, you know, we may clash a little on that. So, you know, you learn to compromise a bit. Paul Greenaway will only ask me to take something out if... It's not working for the, in the concept of the whole show, but basically I choose the work. And normally there's, but I would usually take more work than I need so that, you know, there's work to choose from and you can actually make a good show because the show has to look good. Can you transport all of your work around by yourself? 
I used to uh, carry it with me on the plane, like roll it up and you know put it into baggage and stuff. But um, now I just get someone to pick it up and take it away because it's, it's scary. I mean, I was going to where was I going to the Madrid Art Fair and lost the work because it's just in baggage, you know. You know. Say about the myth that you can't make a living from being an artist. Um, I don't think it's a myth. I think it's very rare to make a living as an artist. Is that you? You can now, though. You're in a position now where you can live off your artwork. I've made a living from my work for over ten years now, but if you can look at statistics, and only twelve percent of artists manage to do that, most earn less than you know twenty-seven thousand a year or something like that, and that's not enough to have an art career because. The more your career develops, the more expensive it gets. Yeah. The, you know, you, you've got to plough back, back and back and back into it, you know, and uh, I, I've got an assistant now that works one day a week and, you know, so... But don't go into it thinking you're going to make a living necessarily. Shouldn't stop you if you're passionate, though. Do you intend to paint for the rest of your working career or do you intend to move on to becoming an art teacher or something else? No, when I, when I stop painting, if I stop painting it'll be because I think I'm painting crap and I don't want to paint crap and if that day happens I'm going to look after animals. <laughs> That's true, I, I'd be one of those people with joeys in, you know, in pretty pouches in my kitchen. Just really briefly, it was accidental. I mean, I never did art at, at um, high school. And uh, I, fin I left school when I was 14. And I could draw, but because I'd never done art, I did the, the science stream and all of that. Um, I actually went and did hairdressing, which I hated from the moment I set my foot inside the door. But anyway, so I finished that and I got married very young and my husband uh, went to art school. So through him I saw art school, which it was just one of those things and it was like coming home. And so I left him and went to art school. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. I mean, you know, it, things can happen and he was, you know, it's not, I think it's fantastic that I met him and it happened. It might not have happened without that. I, I'd left hairdressing by that stage because I hated it. At that point it wasn't particularly, it's a lot more creative now I think than it was when I was doing it. And, um, you know, who knows, I, I tried lots of different things. I worked in hospitality a lot. Like anybody who's trying to go through art school, I worked, you know, four or five years behind a bar through art school. Found out I could paint. I think we might leave it there. Thank you very much. Good luck with all your work.